ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We were in our series on uh, how to gain happiness a successful marriage and we finished the first chapter which we were speaking about al hadith al waridah fi at targhib fi zawaj hadiths that speak about and we took two hadith that speak about urging the youth to get married male or female and then we moved on to the second uh, chapter which was al hadith al waridah fi husn al ikhtiyar we took two hadiths that spoke about choosing the right, right spouse. One hadith for the female and one hadith for the male. The type, type of person that they need to choose. Inshallah ta'ala in today, uh, today's series, in today's series inshallah ta'ala, we're going to take five hadith, five hadith. There are what? al waridatu fil umur illati tasbiqu ad aqd al nikah. Five hadith that pertain to things that a person needs to do before marriage. Just before the contract of marriage takes place, things that a person needs to do. So, inshallah ta'ala. Five narrations, inshallah. Five things we'll be speaking about. The first hadith in this chapter is the hadith narrated in Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said la tunkahul ayyimu حتى تستأمر ولا تنكح البكر حتى تستأذن قالوا يا رسول الله وكيف إذنها قال أن تسكت متفق عليه This hadith the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he said a virgin is not married off حتى تستأمر until she is sought Permission. ولا تنكح البكر. Sorry. لا تنكح الأيم حتى تستأمر. The non-virgin is not married unless she's she is consulted. The non-virgin. She is not married off unless she is consulted. وَلَا تُنْكَحُ الْبِكْرُ And the virgin is not married off. حَتَّى تُسْتَأْذَنَ Unless permission is sought from her. The first one, the first part is talking about a woman who went, be, went through marriage before. Either she's a divorcee, her husband divorced her, or her husband died. But she went through a legal marriage. She is consulted about her marriage. In other words, she unless she gives command, because the woman who is a widow, her amar, her command, is what is used to proceed the process. Because she can't speak for herself. She's went through marriage before. She knows what she's looking for. Not only that, she also has the courage to say what she wants and what she doesn't want. As for the virgin, as for the virgin, she's, she is shy. And she doesn't want to talk. 
especially when her father comes up to her and says to her, um, this man wants to get married to you or uh, she's shy to say yes to her dad. So what is done? She's not married off unless she gives permission. So the Sahabas, they said, Ya Rasulullah, because they know that the uh, virgin is shy and she won't speak. So they said, Ya, ya Rasulullah, or oh, the Messenger of Allah, wa kayfa idnuha? How can a virgin give permission? How does she do that? Qala an taskuta. That is if she's silent. If she's silent and she's shy, then her permission is that silence. If she's silent and she doesn't speak and she doesn't say anything when she's been told about it, then that means she's in agreement with it. This hadith is very important, especially for the Muslim community, the Asian community, rather more often. They know this concept of arranged marriage. An arranged marriage is from min asbab al mashakil al zawjiyah fi zamanina hada. This time that we're living today, one of the greatest reasons why two married individuals are not getting along and they're having a hard time together and they are struggling with one another and that is one of the things that prevents a successful marriage is the woman is forced into a marriage and tujbar al-fatat the woman is actually forced into a marriage on a man on which she doesn't have no love or desire for and she doesn't like him but the reason why this is being done is because of adat, norms, customs that the people have. Reality is, this norms is a jahili norms. It's a pre-Islamic practices. This is what, before Islam came, the disbelievers of that time used to do. And Islam, it freed the women from this. It liberated the women from this concept of being forced to get married. So we say to those people in charge of those girls, Ittaqillaha fi Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. In marrying your daughters off to somebody she hasn't, she hasn't seen, she doesn't know, to force her into it and to give her no alternative and to say, if you don't get married, we will boycott you, we'll turn our backs on you. These individuals need to fear Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And you also need to remember that you guys are responsible of the problem that comes out of it later, the Day of Judgment. And Imam Allah Ta'ala and in front of Allah, the Day of Judgment, you will be questioned about the responsibilities that were placed, placed over your necks. فَإِنَّكُمْ مَسْؤُولُونَ You are responsible. أَمَامَ Allah Ta'ala وَسَيَسْأَلُكُمُ Allah And Allah will question you the Day of Judgment عَمَّ اسْتَرْعَاكُمْ That which He has placed over you. A lot of sisters I've seen whose situations I sometimes deal with, they are married to a man who which they don't even have the same understanding of life and they don't share no perception. They have no, they don't have nothing in common basically. So they are told to be married to one another and it just drags on. Children come from it and divorces are later. So whatever the family were running away from and the shame that they were running away from, they what? They, cut, they go through what is much worse. Their daughter is now divorced because she's with somebody who she didn't want and she couldn't give herself into him. She's also got, been forced to take uh, uh, some, you know, the wrath of Allah by staying with a man which she doesn't want, she doesn't obey him. So it's an ongoing problem. Lidalika, one of the, the biggest problems that you see is this issue is forcing a woman into a marriage which she's not been consulted. The bikr, the virgin, the Prophet sallallahu said, لا تنكحو. It's a command from the messenger. She's not married off. حتى تستأذن. Unless her permission is sought. She's asked. She's questioned. This man has asked for us. 
He's, he wants to get married. Are you in, are, do, you, do you want to get married to him? They, they consult her. If she says, I don't want to get married. If she says, I don't want to get married. Then she is not forced to go f forward with it. As for the woman who's previously been married, then she has more experience and she knows what she's looking for. So she's most likely going to speak for herself. Whereas the virgin may be shy. She might be quiet a bit. She might feel uh, uncomfortable. Whereas the widow, the woman who's previously married, she knows exactly what she wants. So she will say exactly what she feels. So her statement is what's being taken into consideration. So this hadith is very important, brothers and sisters. It's very important. And this is what should be done before the contract of marriage. That the woman is happy with who she has chosen. Also, that being said, we also have to keep in mind, sisters and brothers, whoever you choose to bring into the house, let your family, uh, let your parents have understanding of who it is. Take their advice and their experience on board because they are not there to harm you rather they are there to give you what they think is best for you. So try to work with your parents and parents should work with their children and leave off this this adat jahiliya this pre-Islamic practice in which Islam has freed the women from a sister once emailed me and she said, I brought a man to my parents. I brought a man to my parents. And my parents, they liked him. And they were happy with what they, they found out about him. So, he came for the first day and they started to discuss the money and he told them that he's, he had just started to save. He's been working for a while, but that he recently started to save up. He hasn't got that much money and that which they were asking for. He said, I'm not able to pay that much. But he gave them a lesser price. So they, they told, chose to not go forward with that. They told the boy, we're not going to accept you for our daughter. We don't want you. There was nothing else which he lacked. It's just this concept, they said. The sister said that he, has, he had religious ethics, he had everything. So her parents started to tell her about some other guy whose family were willing to pay much more money. They were trying to, they, they were telling her to leave this individual and go for this guy. Why? Because this man's family are willing to give more money. So, in other words, these parents are selling their daughter. They're selling their daughter and they are really not observing the importance of two individuals being compatible for one another. Two individuals being compatible for one another. And this boy that the family are suggesting for her are back home. They are at back home in Pakistan and she was born and bred in this country. So now she has to go back to Pakistan and meet this man and get to know the culture and get to know how he wants things. And it's just... This is extremely bad for the relationship on later onwards. And a lot of the relationships they come to a fashion destruction like this. Why does it why does it? Because the Sharia already knew that this problem was gonna come. And as I said at the beginning of this class and uh, this uh, series, I said the Sharia works with us. The Sharia is there to help us. Because the creator of us is the legislator who legislated. And they are not going to conflict one another. So what we sisters, parents, we have to understand. The guardians. And we also have to understand, or youngsters and youth, that your parents are not enemies. They are not trying to. They are not there to harm you because they're, one, they're the ones who raised you. And parents also have to understand what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do. And not to see each other as enemies. And to realize that this is one of the greatest problems pertaining to marriage. 
istidhanul taking the permission of the virgin and asking her consulting her if she, if the parents have suggested a person for her and she says i don't mind i actually think the the man that you brought i'm happy with him then that's not a problem but if she's shown disagreement then that marriage is not correct for it to go forward and it's wrong and it is actually going against the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's command here which is wala tunkahu al-bikr hatta tustadhan the second hadith in the chapter that we were talking about which is things that people need to do before they get married this is the second hadith in this chapter and it is the sixth hadith in all of the hadiths put together this chapter inshallah ta'ala we're going to be speaking about the issue of looking at the woman you want to get married to so this is more directed at the boys and the men than it is directed at the female al imam al nasai in his sunan he narrated on the authority of abu huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said or abu huraira said khataba rajulun imra'atan a man asked for a woman's hand in marriage min al ansari from the women of ansar faqala lahu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the prophet said hal nadarta ilayha there was this man who got engaged into a, to a girl he wanted to get married to a woman and he was from the people of ansar the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him hal nadarta ilayha did you go and look at the girl قال لا he said no فامره ان ينظر اليها the prophet then went and commanded him to go and look at her so when the man was asked did you go and look at the woman he said no i haven't the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then commanded him and said to him go and look at her this hadith does not really tell us why the man should go and look at the woman but there is a hadith in which an Imam Tirmidhi narrated on the authority of Al-Mughirah ibn Shu'bah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that Mughirah khataba imra'atan Mughirah wanted to get married to a woman فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم له the Prophet said to him انظر إليها go and look at the woman فإنه أحرى أن يؤدم بينكما Go and look at the woman because this is most likely that the marriage between you two will last forever. Go and look at her so your marriage can be eternal. Your marriage can be for for as long as you both live. Or for as long as you can, inshallah ta'ala Allah is destined for you. So meaning it will stay for long. So the question that arises is the hikmah the wisdom in why the sharia permitted for the man to look at the woman is for is for them to stay together and we have to underline this which is and you dama baynakuma so you both can be together forever in another wording the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said oh that's the wording uh, that, that's the riwayah i can remember but the qawl and imam abu isa tirmidhi when he brought that in his sunan he said this following he said hada hadith hasan this hadith is sound wa qad dhahaba ba'd ahli al-'ilm ila hada al-hadith wa qalu and he said some of the scholars they took this hadith on board and they said la ba'sa an yunzara ilayha an yunzara ilayha la ba'sa an yunzara ilayha there's no problem for him to look at her ma lam yara minha muharraman as long as he does not look at that which is haram and this is the qaul of imam ahmed and ishaq wa ma'na qawluhu and imam tirmidhi then goes on to say and the meaning of the prophet which is ahra an yu'dama baynakuma it means ahra an tadum al mawaddata baynakuma it means that 
by the man looking at the woman, the marriage will be full of love for one another and it will remain. The mawadda, the love, the compassion that is between the man and the woman will stay forever. Now, this issue I have to mention a couple of things inshaAllah ta'ala. First of all, I'm going to speak about um, from the angle of the people, the guardians and the parents, or even the girls themselves. They fall into two camps. Mutashaddid and Mutasahil. Mutashaddid alay, Mutasahil. Those who are too extreme from the guardians of the girls and the girls themselves. For example, a man may request from the girl's father or the girl's uncle or her brother, whoever's in charge of her affairs, or even the girl herself, and one of them will reject and say, you'll not see the, our girl and you'll not look at our daughter. How dare you ask us of this? Disrespectful that you ask us to allow you to look at our daughter. Who do you think we are? Or the girl herself will find the brother a, a evil person that is not religious, that he is a person who wants to commit haram with her. So she thinks that I'm not going to let him. And she says to him, you're not going to see me until the day of the wedding or the day we get married. And this is not correct because of the problems that occur between the two. A lot of harm comes from it. They, the divorce that happens on the first night, he sees her and he doesn't like what he saw. And so he asks if he can leave her. And the reason why that would happen is because This is a result of opposing the Prophet's statement. Because the Prophet, did he not say The mawadda, the love, would have stayed if the man knew what he was getting himself into. So the rejecting, the rejecting and refusing the request of the boy this is what it leads to. And even if he does stay in the marriage, he stays with what? He stays with uh, dealings that are not nice. He doesn't deal nicely with the girl anymore because he's not attracted to her. So even if he does stay with her and doesn't let her go, their marriage is not going to stay for good or it's going to be a painful marriage. And this is something if we've not seen it, we've heard of some people who suffer from this. And there are cases, situations which I personally have experienced in people who've told me, who I've dealt with their situations, the way they suffer from this. Where the girl is either not in attra attracted to the boy, or this, that's another issue, but the boy is not attracted to the woman because the family did not let him see her. And so he went forward with it and he got married to her and when he got married to her, when he saw how she looked, he was not happy with it. And it affected his dealings with her until they both, they both went separate ways. Also, there's another extreme. That was the first type of people. There's also the other extreme, which is those who are very liberal, very easy. So they let their daughter go out with the boy. They tell him, oh, you can, yeah, she's all yours. Go, hold hands, have food, talk to each other for three months, look at each other. They tell the girl to beautify herself and they come with mukhalafat shara'iyah. So they make the boy and the girl deal with one another as though they are, as though they are two married couples already. So he's actually seeing everything about her. The look that the Sharia is referring to here is the look that allows, that would lead a man to see to reaching the marrying of this woman. That which can allow the man to say, you know what, I, yep, I'm happy, I want to get married to her. That which will inshallah ta'ala increase love between the two of them. What happens sisters on sisters' side a lot of the time who fall into the second type 
very liberal, very easy. She wants to see a man, so what she does is that she puts on uh, makeup and she beautifies herself and she makes herself look like what she really isn't. And any one of you who know would know that makeup can make a person look totally different from how they looked before. Meaning, in other words, a makeup can make a person look like two different people. It can make a person look two different people. So the man, when you wear the makeup for him, and you dress up for him, and you look in this particular manner, and he sees you like this, this is a form of deception. Because when he then gets married to you, and you're not like this, he will fall into the problem that he fell into the first time. The first problem, which is, is as though he never saw you. It's like he's not seen you, and now he sees you for how you really look. This will defeat the purpose of why the man was even allowed in the first place to look at the woman. The whole purpose that the man was allowed to look at the woman is for him to know what he, he's getting himself into and so that the marriage can continuously carry on between them two. So, the issue of looking is very important. And the Sharia had permitted it. Now, I want to mention two things before I, inshallah ta'ala, move on to the other hadith. And that is, the looking at a woman is not haram in and within itself. A man looking at a woman is not haram in and within itself. In other words, it is haram when we know what purpose he's looking at her for. The man can't look at this particular woman if he doesn't want to get married to her. But the minute it is for the purpose of marriage, it becomes what? It moves from it being it moves from it being haram for it to be what? Either, uh, if we take the process of the statement, which is the Amr, the command that he gave, wujub. Or if we take the view of the fuqaha who said, which is istihbab, highly recommended that he looks. Now, this is us looking at not the looking in and within itself, but rather what it's going to lead to. And in the Sharia, the haram are two types, and they're like that. Things which are haram in and within itself, like zina, not in any way, form or shape would zina ever be halal. We don't look at why you're doing zina, we don't know, zina is haram. Are you with me? Shulbul khamr, drinking alcohol, is in and within itself haram. We don't ask ourselves and say, well, if you're drinking khamr to be awake all night, so you can do dhikr, then it's permissible. La la la, it's haram. Whereas the looking of a, at a woman, is, it is haram when, we, when you're looking at her, ladha, enjoying. Huh? But if the man is looking to get married to her, it is then permissible. It is then, it is then permissible. We also learn from this hadith, that was the first point. The second thing that we learn from this hadith, which is the purpose of why a man is permitted or allowed to look at a woman which he is intending to get married to. Is So they both will have love desires for one another. That the man will not later think to himself, I've been deceived, I didn't know what I got myself into, I want to divorce this woman. Sharia is fighting against the concept of divorce. It wants both of these individuals to stay with one another. It wants both of them to be with one another. So if the looking at the woman is permitted so they can stay with one another, oh family members of the girl, the girl herself should not prevent the man from wanting to see her. Second one is, second thing is, oh sisters, 
don't make yourself look like what you're not really because then that defeats the purpose of him later remaining and staying with you so the sister should dress and be the way she is when she's at home another point that I have to bring to the attentions of the sisters which is a very important point is the issue of when does a woman know that she can show herself to a man how do you know that this man is serious in wanting to get married to you a man who has reached a point in meeting your family members sitting with your father and your father and he and they've both spoken this is a serious individual he's taken the matter to the supreme court it's your father so at this particular point it is a person who is permitted to see you but if he saw you one day and you take off your hijab off on the street for him and that is not that is haram so it's important that we place things in its correct place it's important that we place things in its correct place